Hello everybody, this is Mike here at Game From Scratch, and welcome back to the second episode in The Others. A look at game engines that get a little bit less attention than some of the better known engines out there. And today what we're looking at is the JMonkey engine. Now the J in JMonkey engine stands for Java. And if you're looking for a 3D Java game engine, this is probably your only bet. At least one with the full robust set of tools, etc. But the good news is it's also a pretty solid game engine, as we will see in a second. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Now first off, JMonkey engine, engine is available at J jmonkeyengine.org. It is completely free, open source, released under the BSD license. The BSD license basically is one of the more liberal ones. Uh, there's some limitations on what you can do and modify with the source code itself, but that's about it. You have no requirement to uh, pay them anything, open source your project or anything like that. So uh, very liberal license on this guy. So it is effectively a free engine for you to use. Uh, it's very much under active development. There are new releases uh, periodically done by the community. Um, and functionality wise, it's got a pretty solid Solid set of feature specs. Um, so you know you got your lighting and shadow shaders, a full shader editor. Uh, there's physics in there, special effects, um, game logic organization into game states or application states, uh, custom controls, uh, input, UI controls, networking, cinematics, terrain, and physics simulations. Now we're not going to see all of those in today's demonstration, but if you are interested in learning more about this particular game engine, I actually already featured it in the Closer Look at series. So if you want to get more of a deep dive, do be sure to check that out. I will link that down below as I will link this as well. Now you might be wondering what games have been made with the JMonkey engine and for the most part this is a very indie focused game engine so a lot of smaller projects etc um, and it actually is available on all major desktop platforms as well as iOS, Android and VR support so you, you can create a game for a number of different platforms here but probably the best known game at least that I could find is a game called Rising World which is in early access on Steam. Now I'm not saying this is the only major game out there but this is probably the preeminent one that I found and as you can see the graphics results out of it are pretty solid. So it is capable of coming out with some um, pretty good graphics. And as you can see from the reviews here, it actually seems to be a decent game itself. Um, so it has been used to create some commercial games, but this is not an engine on par with, say, Unreal Engine for graphic fidelity. Just do be aware of that. But it is still a quite capable game engine. It's built on top of the NetBeans IDE, and here it is in action. So if you ever use NetBeans for, NetBeans for Java, you'll be immediately comfortable with this user interface. Otherwise, it's not that bad to learn. It's not overwhelming like say Eclipse is. Um, and here we are in it. Let's go ahead and we're just going to walk through a very simple project, show you some of the highlight features of working with JMonkey Engine. First thing we need to do, of course, is actually make a project. And uh, we'll just create one from the uh, basic game class. Uh, I will call this my game for YouTube. That won't collide with anything. Go ahead and create that. And when you're done, go ahead and finish. Now, one thing I'm going to be doing, this isn't really important to you, but I'm going to bring in some uh, of the built-in assets that are available in a library. One of the cool things is you can actually bundle a bunch of assets as a library, share them that way. Uh, so go ahead, and we're just going to bring in their test data. It's just, it's got some textures, etc. we may use later in this demonstration. So we'll import that. That is now available to us. So let's go ahead and take a look at the default application it has created for us. It's here under source packages. I think an idea how simple the code potentially can be when dealing with JMonkey Engine. And here is a project. Zoom that in a little bit, and you'll see the code is pretty straightforward. Your main, that's your application entity point. All we're doing is calling start when it's ready, and then we're overriding the initialization app, and this is what's going to do to set up your world. In this particular case, all we did is we created a box, created geometry using the box, um, created a material for it of type unshaded, made the color blue, attached that material to the geometry, and then attached that geometry to the root node. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. You'll notice here we're inheriting from a class called Simple Application. And Simple Application just gives you some default behaviors. It gives you a WASD key navigation and mouse look. So if you don't want that functionality, obviously, you inherit from a lower level class. But in this particular case, that works quite well for me. Go ahead and run that, and you will see here it ran. Now, one thing to know about this is that this guy is built over, um, oh, I forget, uh, J, 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 Oh, low-level Java library that's used for everything, but this name is not coming to me. Uh, LWJGL uh, is the underlying technology provider here. This thing will support OpenGL 2 through 4 on the back end. And as I mentioned earlier, you can actually build for various different platforms, including both mobile and VR now. Uh, so we'll go ahead and use the runtime, run our game. Nothing overwhelming. Blue box, was keys to navigate around, mouse to look around. All right, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Now let's look at making something a little bit more interesting. And what we're gonna do now is create a scene. So go to your assets here, go to scenes, right click, new, and empty scene. 
Um, yeah, sure, new scene, that works for me. Go ahead and create that. And this just created a new scene in our world. Go up to the scenes category here. Open that guy up and press this guy. Now, I don't know why when you double click it, it doesn't open the editor. That's a frustrating thing from the usability expectations. But uh, here is our scene. See here at the root node, we can go ahead and add things to the root node. Pretty typical scene graph going on. So you can add your lighting, uh, you can add controls, you can add terrain, which we'll do in a second, etc. Now what you normally want to do at this point is import some kind of an, um, a, a 3D model. This is one of those areas where JMonkey Engine really shines. I'm going to show you bringing in a GLTF file that I exported out from Sketchfab. And I tried about a dozen of these, including up to four or 500 megabytes in size. And I never had a failure. So that's just really impressive. That's normally a point of failure with just about every game engine. So let's go ahead and bring in an asset. So we can do file. Uh, we want to do import model, like so, open model, and grab that GLTF file right there. Next up, you can see there's a demo of what we're bringing in. The assets came with it. Very straightforward, worked right out of the box. And then what are we going to call it? And I will call it TIE Fighter for obvious reasons. And go ahead and do the import. So. What do we got in here? Da, 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 da. Color, space, material, blah, 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 blah. Oh, well. not that important. All right, so our model should now be available. So we go here to the model, so we expand that out, and there you see we now have a TIE Fighter. So with our scene selected, with the root node selected, let's click on the J3O it created for us and say Add in Scene Compositor. And kaboom, there is our object in the world. Now let's go ahead and let's scale this guy down a bit because it's ginormous. So, and now in our world, let's go ahead and add a light. So let's just do a couple of point lights. Point light. All right, grab our point light. And then we'll do another. So you'll notice there are other lighting options. Oops, selected the wrong thing. And you'll find the selections on here can be a little finicky. Uh, another area where it could definitely use a bit of improvement. There we go. And I'll do a front light. A very crappy three-point lighting setup. Grab our point light and drag it forward. All right, so there in our world, we have a model. We got three lights in the world. I'll go ahead and do a save. Now, sometimes it does save, sometimes it doesn't. I don't understand the logic behind this, so I often close my scene to make sure that it prompts me to go ahead and do a save. So open that guy back up, and we should be able to see it in running and now saved. So let's go ahead and actually use this scene. And in order to do that, we're going to need to go back to our code and change some things out. Namely, we don't really want it to create us a blue box. So instead, what we want to do, see over here, you've got this palette. Well, this is where you can get basically snippets of code that you can work with. So what we want to do is go here to the J, uh, JME scene collection, and we will load a scene. And just bring that over here, drag it into our code like so. I do wish it tabbed correctly, but that's a pretty minor complaint. Now, another thing you notice is there's a bunch of import errors because uh, all of the classes we just brought in aren't necessarily declared. You can do it's control shift I and have it automatically fix all those imports for you instead of having to do them one at a time. And really all that did is added the requisite import files up top here. So you see it brought in some nice template code for us. Uh, there's a couple things we don't actually need. So this is basically finding your home directory and nobody loads from their home directory. And there's where that uses that variable. And again, we don't really want to use that. Instead, what we want to do here is, and I'm going to screw this up probably three times, but assets, models, Oops, models tie fighter scene.j3o. We'll save that. Oh, I'm loading the wrong thing. Never mind, I actually want to load our level. So I told you I'd screw this up. What we want instead of the models, but that would be the code to load a model. Uh, but instead, what I want to do is go assets scenes new scene.3j or j3o. And save that. So basically what we did is load our file and then attached it to the scene graph like so. And theoretically that is all we need to do. Run our code. And ta-da! There is a 3D model loaded into the scene. So you can get very far, very good results very, very quickly in this engine. And this is actually something that to get this far in less than 10 minutes in the game engine 
is not generally that easy. It's a very impressive thing they've done here. Now, let's go one step farther and go back to our uh, scene editor. I'll show you a couple more things and then wind this up. Once again, you want more details, do check out the closer look instead. So let's edit our scene. And as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna go ahead and add some terrain to this scene. So with the root node selected, add a spatial, and we are going to do a train. And it's gonna give you the various different options. Uh, I use it, you can bring it in as a completely flat train, or you can do uh, an image-based height map, or you can create a hilly train. We'll go with flat. Um, how big to make the texture it's gonna paint on. There you go. Let's select our train that was just created right here. And let's move it down, 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 down. Oops, come on. And again, I find the editor flaky at times. And I don't know if it's a me thing or a them thing, but I'm gonna just go ahead and we'll exit back out. We'll go back in, edit again. All right, I'll do this by hand. This is, without a doubt, the biggest gripe I have. I think I went the wrong way. All right, there we go. So we're now a little bit below the world. Actually, we'll go a little bit farther. I do find the tools are a little flaky in the editor. Zero comma minus ten comma zero. All right, so our ground is definitely below us, and there I also illustrated some of the, flip, the some of the problems you'll actually run into. I've run into manipulation problems, uh, selection problems. So if I'm in selection mode, I have trouble. This is for placing the world cursor. I just this is an area where they definitely need some improvement. The uh, the editor can be very frustrating to work with. But now that our train is actually created, with that train selected, see over here, you've got uh, other options. We do an edit train. And using the edit train function, you've got your various different controls down here. So what we can do is raise the ground up in spots, like so, and paint the train however you want. We can change the radius of our modifier, the strength of our modifier, like so. So edit your terrain as you see wish. Uh, another thing that you commonly want to do is create uh, paint with multiple surfaces. This is why I imported some stuff earlier on. So let's say we want train, pond. Uh, let's bring in pond. Oh, that's not what I was expecting. All right, well, if we're gonna do that, might as well get some rocks. Oh, which one do I want? There. So now we have a separate surface. We could bring in. We can bring the normal map for that surface as well. I think that was yeah, that guy. And now we can paint with it. Should we? Oh, damn it! I just did a delete. All right, one sec. Okay. So this time, instead of hitting the delete, I'm going to hit the paint button, and now we can paint with that other texture. You can blend them together, mix them together, and obviously this is how you would go about creating your world. And when we're done, save that up. You can head back over to um, our placement in the world. And the one last thing I'm going to demonstrate is just bringing in a skybox. So come here, skybox. We could do a multi-texture skybox. And sky, I think it was lagoon was multi-texture. Uh, which one's it asking me for? North. South. East. West. Up. Down. And finish. And boom, now you see in our game world, we have an infinite environment going on around us. We have a object in our world, we have a terrain defined, etc. We'll go ahead and just play this one out. 
So you can actually do a hell of a lot in less than 15 minutes using this game engine. And it didn't save. Now this is again another fourth source of frustration. I don't know why it doesn't just save when I hit save every time. So it is also an engine with a few usability warts. But there you see, we did a pretty profound amount of uh, production in a very, very short period of time and with some pretty solid graphic results. So um, yeah, that's essentially what I'm gonna cover today. One last time, if you want more details, do be sure to check out the Closer Look at. It goes into a lot more details about programming, uh, the functionality like physics editors, etc. that are available in JMonkey Engine. But I think this 15 minutes should have given you a pretty good idea of what exactly we're dealing here with this engine. Uh, it's it's capable, you know, you're not gonna create an next AAA game here, but if you're a Java developer or you're looking for something that's accessible and easy to learn, JMonkey Engine just might be the tool for you. Just do be aware, the editor can be an extremely frustrating thing. On the one hand, it's great to have it and it makes the engine very, very accessible, but on the other hand, um, it, it, it is kind of full of bugs. So, you know, bit of a trade-off. Uh, so that's it for now. Hope you enjoyed that. Hope you're enjoying the other series. Uh, we got a whole lot more game engines to cover, but that one today was the JMonkey engine. Let me know what you thought of it down below. All right, that's it for now. I will see you all later. Goodbye.